On February 22, 2024, in a recorded statement, Bill Nelson declared that Odysseus had conquered the moon. And at the moment that all of that was happening, a number of people on my chat during a live stream coverage of this particular event began to say that all of this was premature, that really Intuitive Machines or Bill Nelson shouldn't have been declaring victory quite so soon. And it turns out they might have been right, because even though the landing was successful for the most part, Odysseus didn't exactly conquer the moon. Odysseus tripped over a rock and fell on his face on the moon. Now, before you think that I'm going to start dissing intuitive machines and their accomplishments, well, I'm not. What they've done is an extraordinary thing, but at the same time, it's a cautionary tale for future missions to the moon, especially the ones that involve human beings. Good afternoon and welcome to a brief bulletin here on The Angry Astronaut. I just got back from Washington, D.C., back home here in Milton Keynes, and I just wanted to thank everybody who made this trip possible, both on Patreon and PayPal. Those of you who contributed to this trip made everything happen. I certainly couldn't have gone otherwise. Martin Potts, my latest supporter on Patreon, and 21 other new Patreon. Patreon members have definitely made a big contribution and will do so on an ongoing basis as we try to get up to that 1% threshold, 1% of my subscribers supporting us on Patreon, which will make these kinds of trips possible a lot more frequently. So I'm going to be quoting a lot of stuff that I learned at this convention because there are a lot of power players in space flight there. But let's talk about this particular issue first. As all of us may know at this point, the landing from intuitive machines did not go off without a hitch. There were a number of problems. Now, the most significant problem that the lander had was the loss of the navigational LIDAR, something that was absolutely essential to a safe landing on the moon. Without LIDAR scanning the terrain beneath the lander and finding last second obstructions, rocks, debris, terrain, whatever, then the lander would be in a great deal of jeopardy while it was trying to set down. When this failed, they had no choice but to turn to a payload that NASA had placed on board, an experimental LIDAR payload, and they beamed two lasers down to the surface of the moon, orbiting an additional time while they got the whole thing set up, and used that LIDAR system to set down on the moon instead. This was very problematic because this payload was not designed to take Odysseus down to the moon in the first place. But that is precisely what they did, and for the most part, it was quite successful. But as I say, most of us know, it was not 100% successful. As near as we know, the vehicle was traveling laterally as well as vertically during its final descent process. It's possible that it may have made a last second maneuver to try to avoid a rock, and then it caught its foot on that rock and fell on its face. I would say that's probably the best way to describe what happened. Now, although this certainly is not an ideal situation, it isn't cataclysmic either. The sun appears to be hitting the solar panels and the payloads, the scientific payloads on board, at least the ones that don't have to be deployed to the surface, well, they seem to be operating all right as well. However, the Eagle cameras, the ones that were designed to photograph the lander as it made its descent, well, those were never deployed because the lander was running into difficulties and in trying to execute its descent anyway, and that hovering maneuver that would have been necessary as the lander deployed its cameras became a little bit dangerous. And so they couldn't deploy the cameras at that point, although they will be deployed afterwards, or at least that's the 
the current plan, and then we'll be able to see how the lander is actually situated on the moon. Now, once again, to reiterate, this is an amazing accomplishment. This is something that the United States has not done for over 50 years, and for the most part, all of the scientific payloads, or at least most of them, should be able to do their job during this mission. The solar panels are collecting energy and generating power. The batteries are fully charged, so everything should work out just fine. However, that doesn't mean that we should consider this mission to be an absolute success any more than the Japanese Slim mission was. The Lunar Sniper may have delivered its payload to the right location, but it wasn't upright, and because of the location of its solar panels, it almost lost its opportunity to do its job. Although, it did carry out its job very well, but on its face. And that's going to be the same situation with this probe now. And if this had happened with a manned mission, the consequences would have been utterly cataclysmic. Nobody would have been talking about conquering the moon at that point. So why are these things happening? Why do we have two consecutive probes fall over when they should be set up to land very well even on an uneven surface in rugged terrain? Well, it's because the Lunar South Pole is a lot more rugged than any place we've ever landed before. This is a mountainous region. This is a heavily cratered region. Not only that, it's also a very shadowy region. The sun doesn't reach this part of the moon as well as the regions where Apollo set down. That makes it a lot more problematic and a lot more difficult to try to land there as well. And because it's such a rugged region, that's the reason that there is lunar ice there in the first place. There are many regions of the lunar south pole that are cloaked in perpetual shadow and probably still have water ice waiting for us to exploit it. However, in order to get at that water ice, we are going to have to somehow navigate this very mountainous and heavily cratered region. And thus far, we haven't had a hell of a lot of success. The Indian Chandrayaan lander is the only one that's been able to successfully set down in this region. The Slim lander, although not landing in this particular region, was still landing in a very difficult area as far as terrain was concerned, and then of course Odysseus also had problems. We are most probably never going to find a landing pad in the lunar south pole region that's going to be absolutely level and flat for our purposes, which means having tall, slender, top-heavy landers is never going to work out very well. Now, the Slim wasn't exactly tall and slender, but it didn't have any sort of landing gear that spread out from the bottom in order to give it a wider base to land on. And the Odysseus is three meters tall and two meters wide with its landing gear deployed. Now, that isn't terrible, but at the same time, still not as good as the NASA LEM that had a landing gear that was 50% wider than the LEM was tall. And that sort of squat configuration is absolutely essential if you're landing on dangerous terrain. But do you know what's a hell of a lot worse than Odysseus? as far as being tall and top-heavy? That's right, you guessed it, Lunar Starship. Lunar Starship is an enormous behemoth that thus far has never set down on anything except a concrete landing pad. And if it's going to be setting down in difficult terrain at the Lunar South Pole, it could run into some very serious problems. And guess what? Blue Moon from Blue Origin is not really all that better, as you can see. This is Blue Moon Mark 1, by the way, the cargo version that's supposed to be carrying out a couple of test runs here in the very near future. According to Jacqueline Cortez, Senior Director of Civil Space at Blue Origin, this version of the Blue Moon has actually passed its preliminary design review and should be ready to go on a new Glen rocket sometime early next year. 
However, as you can see, the Mark II version is a little bit wider, has a bit of a broader base, and maybe they could add some additional landing gear to make that situation even better. But the majority of the weight, the propellant, the oxidizer, all of that is on top. The bottom is reserved for the crew. And frankly, as we've been seeing lately, these conceptual drawings are misleading in the extreme, not as far as the spacecraft are concerned, but as far as the landing facilities are concerned. I don't think there's a single place in the Lunar South Pole region that is this flat and this accommodating to a large, top-heavy spacecraft. I think that these vehicles are going to run into some significant problems unless we somehow send in some robots excavators ahead of time to build a landing pad on the lunar surface. How unfortunate it is that NASA decided to not go with a low-slung vehicle that was more than capable of landing on a significant slope, as you can see here. Alpaca is not pictured in a fanciful region of the moon that has a perfectly flat landing pad, but instead is sitting on the type of grade that we are likely to encounter at the Lunar South Pole. We are supposed to learn something from the CLPS missions, not just scout out the lunar surface, but also from the lessons learned from these missions, come up with better ways to make sure that human beings can travel to the lunar south pole and return safely. And unless we significantly modify the vehicles that we have planned thus far, because I really think that they are not the best design at all for a lander that needs to set down in a region that's characterized by very rough terrain, lots of craters, and difficult slopes and grades, then we are condemning ourselves to a number of failures before we're probably going to have a success. Hopefully those failures will involve unmanned vehicles because a failure involving a manned ship will probably kill Artemis forever. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, please subscribe. It's very important to the success of my channel and as always, stay angry about space.